Good evening, welcome. My name is Avram Shimon Mahler and I'm going to be a moderator this evening. First of all, thank you for joining us in the first lecture in a series entitled Keeping Safe. The series is a three-way partnership and project of Madregos Midwest, a Chicago organization that focuses on the well-being of adolescents and young adults in our community. Nefesh Chicago, which is a professional organization that created a forum for Orthodox mental health practitioners to share issues relevant to our community, problem solve and grow in their profession. And the ATT, the Associated Tamatoros, which is a central agency for Chicago's Orthodox Day Schools and specifically REACH, ATT's department to help schools include and educate all students and uh, provide special education for students who need it. It's our collective aspiration that these lectures will assist parents in understanding their role in keeping their kids safe while helping them navigate the big world out there. Tonight's presenter is Dr. Akiva Perlman, PhD. He is an international speaker on the topics of abuse, addiction, and trauma. He has educated more than 300 from social workers from our community and is currently serving as a professor at the Worst Wireless School of Social Work. Dr. Perlman is a clinical director of ODA Wellness Institute, a clinic which serves the Hasidic community in Williamsburg. He maintains a practice in Fresh Meadows where he resides with his wife Tamar and his children. At the end of the presentation this evening, there will be some time for Q&A. If you have any questions you'd like to present, please uh, chat them to me, Avram Muller, in the chat, and uh, I will present them to, the, uh, to Dr. Perlman at the end of the presentation. Please welcome Dr. Perlman. Hi, Rabbi Muller, thank you very much. Rabbi Bressler as well, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, and thank you, Madrigos, um, who reached out, and I, and I heard there are many other organizations involved as well. Um, and it's just a real, a real honor to be here with you all tonight. Um, I don't take this, this role, this position, this moment lightly for to some degree I'm representing the beautiful people, the beautiful souls that I, I get to spend much of my life with, the people who have shared their story with me and somehow I want to give them a voice and share their story with the rest of us um, so we can learn from it and somehow find a way to nurture ourselves, also nurture our children in a way that is beneficial to them. So tonight we're really gonna speak about issues related to teenagers acting out sexually, um, the story of abuse, the story of trauma, and what we could do to help enhance our relationships, which are so pivotal and critical, um, especially during that stage. But they're also, as we all know, deeply complicated. Um, but to try to bring all those issues together to a collective whole so we could understand it in a meaningful way. Um, but over here, again, like I said, it's about the opportunity to, to represent a voice of people who generally remain silent. Um, as we're gonna get into the story of sexual abuse, one of the features that we're gonna notice and we're gonna review over and over again is how it takes place in silence, it takes place in darkness, and it most often remains in that place, often for years and years. I recently had a man um, who's, who's a Rebbe in Yeshiva um, who reached out to me just to, for a consultation, just to speak. And he was well into his 70s. And it was the first time in his life that he shared his story with another human being. Um, and we're talking about an individual who's been married. He's been in Chinuch for years and years, giving over beautiful Torah to, to all our, our children, our people. Um, and yet he remained silent for... 60 plus years, um, and, and it kind of tells the story, the severity of what this all means. So having an opportunity to speak about it in this forum and give these individuals who remain quiet somewhat of a voice, um, it honors them, it respects them, and also empowers us as a people to say, what could we do um, to enhance them? So it's a great honor. It's a great honor to be here with you. Um, speaking about sexuality, um, any degree of sexuality in public um, gives me no comfort, no joy, no satisfaction, um, only because we're raised, and for, for right reason, we're raised with, a, raised with a sense that sexuality, intimacy, is not something that we generally discuss in public because it's inherently special. It's inherently holy and private, and that's the way it's supposed to be. Um, however, 
and even like this, we have no choice really but to speak about it because our brothers and our sisters, parents, people, leaders are suffering. And as a result of that suffering, we don't really have the luxury to say we could remain quiet about something. Um, and, and there was a client of mine who was talking about um, the need to reveal this, where he's saying the, the joy, the pleasure, the comfort that it gives me, that someone will be speaking about this story, my story in public. Um, it reveals something that, that, that is so deep within me that it gives me a great deal of comfort. It warms my heart, as he said. It warms my heart to know that this is something that we're going to speak about. And now while our sensitivities as a community with these issues are very well-founded and very meaningful and, and are all there for the right reason, because as we all know, sexuality is so inherently private and beautiful, um, it also contributes to the problem, the sense of, of taboo, the sense of secrecy, because we're sort of raised without a great deal of language when it comes to these issues. Like we don't have the ability, the words, um, to speak about these issues with, with the people in our lives, certainly with our children. We're going to get into this in a little bit later. But at this point in 2021, it's been close to at least 20 years, let's say 20 years, where we've all been educated as adults, as parents, um, to speak to our children about such issues. Yet we'd all be alarmed to know that the reality is that most parents don't. And that's not only within the from world, but it's in the world at large. Most parents simply do not speak to their kids about this because it's taboo, because we don't have the words, we don't have the language. Um, and it's this vehicle for us speaking about it openly that hopefully will give us the courage and, and, and the direction to speak about this because we need to, it's imperative. Because even if it prevents one child or one adolescent uh, from suffering, um, it's not only that individual who we're gonna be helping, but it's also future generations. For anyone, any rub or therapist, or anyone who's knowledgeable enough about these issues, they understand that, that this type of pain that we're speaking about is not isolated to the individual itself. It tends to last several generations. It tends to make its way into marriages. It makes its way into parenting. It makes its way into the intimacy of that marriage and permeates the environment uh, by which it exists. Um, so we need to find a way to, to, uh, to speak about it while also upholding the sanctity of what intimacy really is. And this is an absolute distortion. There's nothing about what we're speaking tonight that is related to intimacy, but it is an honest discussion and dialogue about our experience with sexuality altogether. Uh, and it's like a muscle. Um, I remember one of the, the first times I was sitting with a client and, and something came up that was very taboo, something I never had spoken out loud uh, with another person prior to that moment. And I remember uh, the client brings it up and I just sort of froze. It was one of my worst moments as a therapist. I literally froze and I actually excused myself from the room. I excused myself saying, I just need a minute to compose myself. I came back, we continued the discussion. I almost wanted to hand it, like wanted to hand him a refund, but I was working at a clinic at the time. It wasn't, it wasn't paying too much anyway. Um, but, and thankfully we were able to work through this. But over time, I noticed looking back at that moment that it's a muscle. At that moment in time in my life, I hadn't developed that muscle. I hadn't developed the ability to have a mature conversation with this individual the way he needed me to have it. And for us as parents, it's sort of the same. Um, and community leaders, not just parents, that most of us have not spent time nurturing this part of ourselves, our ability to communicate about these, these sensitive and taboo subject matters. So we need to develop it together in a communal sense um, and, and build this muscle so we could convey the, the sensitive messages um, to, to our children, to our students, in a way that they'll actually be able to receive. Because we all know that if, if we haven't worked through an issue ourselves, trying to communicate it to children or trying to communicate it to even to other adults, it simply doesn't work. We fumble through that conversation and very often it just peters out and we just say, let's move on to something that I feel more comfortable with. So it's something that hopefully collectively we can work on together. So let's jump in. Like, what is the story? Let's let's kind of look at what what does abuse look like? What does sexual abuse look like? And how does it affect people? 
So then we could, by understanding it, develop our, our senses uh, and be able to communicate about it more effectively. So statistics give us a picture um, of what's happening in the world. Um, they definitely tell us a story and we, we, there's no question that we, we have our natural defenses against something like this. Alice Miller, a wonderful trauma author, um, she said, the more painful an experience is, the more likely we are to build defenses around actually um, seeing it, seeing the reality. And all we need to do is to penetrate those defenses and open our eyes and look at the reality. And it'll give us a real sense of what's happening. So when, for most of us, some of us who were raised uh, in the 80s and the 90s, um, and we start, we remember the commercials that were on TV where they had this notion of stranger danger. I still remember, um, I still remember like the flyers that would come home from school sometimes with this picture of, of a van that didn't necessarily have a license plate. And that was the story that was told to us as kids, that you need to stay away from a van that's not identified because there's a person in that van who's going to harm you. They're going to offer you candies and harm you. Now, what we know now from statistics um, what we know from the reality of it is that that's not at all the picture of what this looks like. When we're talking about sexual abuse, we're not speaking about individuals that are foreign to the, to the system, to the family, or even to the individual. 90% of the victims um, of, of sexual abuse starting from childhood all the way through adolescence, 90% um, of the victims know their abuser. Not only do they know their abuser, they tend to know their abuser, abuser pretty well. The next statistic is a little bit, a little bit more challenging to sit with, uh, but it's something we simply need to face, is that 30% of abused children are abused not by people that are foreign to their system, but by people who are actually a part of their system, what we would call family members, people who are uncles, aunts, siblings, parents, um, people who are very, very close to that system. So you, you definitely get a sense almost off the bat that the picture that we have of what this terrible story looks like is very different than what we've been raised to believe. It's not a, a foreigner. These are people that live on our block. These are people who go to our school. They go to our schools. They're individuals who are part of us. And that almost creates a deeper sense of pain when, when people get involved in it. Uh, because they feel like this is not someone from the outside harming me. It would almost be simpler if that were the case. Obviously, that'd be terrible, terribly painful as well. But when it's someone that you know, someone that you're supposed to trust, then it completes, it, it begins to fracture um, your trust in everybody. Because these are the people that are, are supposed to be taking care of you. They're the people who are supposed to be uh, watching out for your well-being. And instead, they're harming you. Um, so the picture of abuse is very, very different. It's about trust. Um, these are the people that, generally speaking, the family members trust, and they're the ones who are uh, causing this pain, which means we need to very, very quickly change our language about this issue, where it's not about a foreigner, but it's about uh, focusing on the self, which we're going to get to a little bit later, as opposed to protecting people from the outside, saying, stay away from dangerous people. We need to start empowering people to build themselves up and say, you're a valuable human being, you're a valuable person, your body is holy. And as a result of that, no one should harm it. No one has the right to harm it. Um, and, and that includes people that you're close with, people that you know. So the nature of this is a lot darker than we might think. It's not them, it's not the people on the outside, but rather it's us. And because that's the story we know from research, that less than 40% of victims end up disclosing. Uh, and that's, by the way, research that's coming from the general population, not specifically from the Jewish community. And when you're talking about people of sexual abuse, less than 40% of, of them ultimately disclosing. You could imagine in an insular community like ours, um, where there's a lot more that will be lost if something is discovered a lot more shame that a person needs to live with. I would suspect that those numbers might even be higher than that, that it's more than 40% potentially within our community that simply remain silent. And that silence kills them from the inside out. You know, when we talk about numbers, um, and I love numbers because they, they tell us a story, they give us facts, they tell us, they, they, they paint a picture of what the reality is. 
However, numbers tend to keep us safe. They tend to keep us separate from the people that are behind those numbers. And I think if we take a moment to realize that when we talk about 40% or 90% or 30, all these, all these statistics that we throw out, we're not speaking about statistics. We're speaking about individuals. We're speaking about people that you and I both know. Um, and and what, what are we doing about that? That's kind of the question we need to ask ourselves. What are we doing to expand ourselves, to create an environment that is more inclusive, um, that will permit these people to come forward and, and suffer just a little bit less at a time? So I want to go a little deeper into the story itself. Um, there was one of, the, one of the more terrible cases I ever had to work with. It was also an honor to work with them. Um, uh, just to be close to, to, to that degree of suffering and do whatever I can to be helpful to them. Um, there was a young girl um, who the parents noticed that as the brother was coming home uh, from yeshiva, she started uh, wetting her bed. And we're not talking about someone who was three years old or four years old. We're speaking to someone at the time was around 13, 14 years old um, and completely regressed at that point. Um, and the parents noticed, they started putting some of the pieces together, that this was a child who was acting out this way as her older brother would come home from yeshiva on his off Shabbos. Um, and finally, when we had the chance, after a very, very long time of sitting with this girl and her family, for her to begin to trust and open up and believe that whatever she shared would be believed, um, and would be nurtured and cared for and not shamed and not contribute to the pain that she was already in. Um, she shared that, that that was the case, that it was her older brother um, who at times, uh, when coming home from yeshiva, she just would pretend she's sleeping and do her best to pretend like that was the case and move on with her life. However, it doesn't work. It doesn't happen that way. Her body, her unconscious, if we want to call it that, was responding, was saying to the world, to her, to her parents, that there's a problem here. There's something here that, that is compelling my body to break. Um, I don't have the words, so therefore my body is going to speak for me. And when we talk about this case, it sort of paints the picture of what it is. It's dark, it's secret, it's in secrecy. Um, it elicits a deep feeling of shame um, that you're doing something wrong. And when you talk about, and it's a question that we have, like why, how does that work? Why does that work that way? Why does someone internalize it the way it is? Just to add to that question a little bit more, there was a study that was done in Denmark, which looked at, and it, it's hard to, I don't wanna go into the details of the study, but they looked at a variety of things that caused and elicited a great deal of pain in people. Um, they looked at all these different events like bullying, someone raised with neglect, you know, someone being beaten, physically harmed. Um, and also sexual abuse was one of the characteristics that they looked at as well. And they, and they looked at which one causes the greatest amount of internal shame, internal harm. Um, and clearly, I say the winner of it, but the one that stood out the most was sexual abuse. It caused the greatest amount of pain. And the question we ask ourselves is why? Why is this event something that we need to pay so much attention to. Why is it something that lasts at times generations? It doesn't seem to go away. Um, what about the features, the characteristics of this terrible event uh, doesn't seem to dissipate over time? So I, I want to back up a little bit for a second and sort of paint an ideal. You know, we talk about what happens when things go wrong, um, but let's talk about when things should be going right, when things are okay. I want to speak a little bit about attachment. Attachment is like this bond that is formed between parents and a child very, very early on. Um, there was a guy, Erickson, uh, Eric Erickson was a theorist, a developmental theorist. And he basically connected the first year of life to the ability for a person to connect with others in adulthood. Meaning there's something that happens at that point that if it was nurtured correctly, then you'll possess the capacity to nurture later on. And if God forbid it wasn't nurtured correctly, then you're going to carry a great deal of pain and have a much harder time connecting with others. And he explained why. He said that when a child is born, if you imagine for a minute, just the imagery, a child is born and you have the most loving parents in the world. There are two ways to look at that child. There's looking at that child and you look directly into to the baby's eyes and you see their soul. 
and you see their value, you see their worth, you see their godliness. And you say, what a gift that I've been given this opportunity to care for this child. And, and you instill in that, in that child a great deal of, of belief and hope and, and self, self-respect. Uh, you believe in that child, you see that child. And seeing that child permits the child to later see itself, to later see its own value. However, if on the other hand, when a parent looks at that child, they're not seeing into the child's eyes, but rather the eyes serve as a reflection, like a mirror. They're looking at themselves and they see their child as a reflection of them, who's there to serve them. And they're not necessarily seen as valuable in their own right, but rather as, as, as characters to, to satisfy the needs of the parents. Then that child is left with a sense of deep yearning for belonging, for value, for self-worth. And that's what we call like a, a fractured, traumatized atta- attachment. Um, so when, a, when we hand over to a child, it's something that's free. We give, we give love, we give faith, um, we give compassion to a child. We're giving them the greatest gift in the world, which is now you could take that with you as you journey forward and, and use it to be successful, use it to navigate your way through a pretty challenging, challenging world that we live in. There's a sense of worth. But what happens if that's taken away? What if that worth that a child has been given at some point is taken away where someone is sort of left with a sense of I'm bad, I'm unworthy, I'm unlovable, I did something bad. And we're not speaking about the experience of a person saying I did something bad. And we all do things that are bad. We all make mistakes. And we all have, have, have things that we need to correct. And that's a very healthy thing that we live with. But the difference between I did something bad versus I am bad is worlds apart. They're two universes. um, And and the difference between a person saying I am bad, that's basically a path of destruction versus a person saying I did something bad. And that's a life filled with growth. Um, But that person is a place of I'm unlovable. I did something wrong. And and that experience that we're speaking about now is, is what we would call shame. Shame is the experience that that you did something wrong inherently there's something wrong with you so when we talk about shame being the opposite of health attachment shame is created when when you're treated like an object and not like a person which is one of the core features of any form of abuse certainly sexual abuse where you're not seen as you are a person but rather you're seen as an object and i was working with a a, a young man um, at the time, he was newly married. It was a very common tale. Speak to any rub, any therapist. The common tale of someone getting married and everything looks great. The resume is perfect. A well-adjusted individual. And then they make their way into the world of intimacy. And it sort of activates this trauma that's never really been dealt with. And then the person begins to devolve. And that's when I met this young man. Um, he was recently married several months. And the marriage was really just hanging, barely hanging on. Um, because that was an area, he had a history of, of, of abuse, and he began to develop shortly after getting married. And when he started speaking about this idea of feeling like an object, not like a person, he, he, he shared with me, he said, during the abuse, which took place when he was, you know, 14, 15 years old, um, and it was done by his uncle, during the abuse, I, I often asked myself and I wondered, did, did this person care about me as a person? Did he see me as a person? Or was I simply an object in his eyes? And that is a part of the essence of shame. Shame also is when a person has their their powerlessness, their inability to protect themselves held in front of them. So they can't really escape that feeling. There was a just a story to personify this idea. Um, I used to used to work at a program called the Living Room. The Living Room is a wonderful organization in Brooklyn for kids recovering from addictions. Um, a whole slew of different addictions, beautiful program. And we used to have these Shabbat songs. Um, at the time, my mother lived in Farakway, and we would use, often use her house um, and her property as a place where for this location of the, the Shabbat song. So we're sitting there, there's around 60 or 70 boys and girls, all of them from, from environments, um, many of them struggling with Yiddish guide at the time. Uh, many have returned since, but at the time there was a lot, a lot of struggle. And we set up a tent, we want to make it respectful. We wanted them to feel like there was someone taking the extra step to make them feel okay, 
because these are very hurt individuals. And we're sitting there at a 10, it was about 10, 11 o'clock at night. And one of the boys in the program uh, runs into the tent and shares that my abuser, the person who abused me when I was younger, is walking down the street. And, and I just want to give you a sense that in this program, uh, anywhere between 60 to 80 percent of the kids who were in the living room had a history of sexual abuse, either in childhood or during adolescence. Um, so the entire place became enraged. Like this was finally their opportunity to get back at someone who took advantage of them when they couldn't stand up for themselves, where they didn't have a voice. Um, and the bravado in the room, I was honestly most scared for the abuser. Um, I was terrified for what was going to happen to him and what was going to happen to the Shabbaton. And what, I, I was literally terrified that they would kill this individual, finally given this opportunity to get back. So I ran ahead as much as I could. And there was a whole gang of people. And imagine he's coming this way, they're coming this way. I'm sort of trying to stand in the middle. And my biggest fear never, never happened. But an even bigger fear and a bigger pain actually did. Um, that as that group of individuals got closer to this, they all slowly started to devolve. They slowly started crying and breaking down. And all these people who just a few blocks away had this power and this energy and were going to rip this guy's head off. Uh, they literally became children. They were reminded of their powerlessness that they felt. And that was not something that went away, even though they got bitter, bigger, their bodies got bigger, they got stronger, which is a very common thing. People who have a history of abuse, very often they do whatever they can to build up their body, um, to make very strong this way with at least the belief that if my body's strong, no one could harm me again. And many of these members did that. And as they got closer, they just became younger and younger and smaller and weaker and more fragile. It broke down. I remember that night myself, uh, Menachem Poznanski was the director of the program, and Gitel Kagan. Uh, we sat there with an entire tent of broken souls um, because they were reminded of the sense of powerlessness that they had felt that was the core, the essence of their shame. Shame is also when a person is forced to experience something that they're not yet ready to experience developmentally. They're not yet there. And even when we talk about sexuality in adolescence, you know, when they're, they're old enough, their body's already responding in a normative way, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're ready for it. They're not prepared for this event. Um, and when you talk about someone who developmentally is not yet prepared and they're engaging in certain acts and certain behaviors, it elicits a great, great deal of shame. And even with children, they'll often say that I, I knew that there was something wrong. I couldn't articulate it. I don't know exactly um, what it, I didn't know exactly what it was about, but, but, I, but I knew it was wrong. It was something inside me that told me it was wrong. Shame is created also when your essence, your most private part of your being is taken advantage of. And when we're talking about a part of your body being taken advantage of, it's not just your body, it's also your being. A part of your being that's taken advantage of, you lose trust. You lose trust not only in that person who's harming you, but you lose trust in people because there's no one there to protect you. There's no one there to guide you. And there's no one there to save you. And very often what happens when you hear from these people later on in life and they speak about their anger, um, that anger extends itself not only to the parents who were not there, who were not there in that moment. It doesn't, it not only extends itself to them, they're a band, they're friends, all leaders, all authority figures. It extends itself to everybody because that person feels that there are certain people in the world that were supposed to care for me. That was their job. Their job was to protect me from the, the pains and the ills of the world, and they didn't accomplish that. And therefore, I lose faith and trust in them. Uh, there was a, a, a man uh, that I know, a, a very dear man. Um, who is he's a Hasidic rub, and he actually comes to speak to my class every few years uh, in grad school. He has a terrible story to share, but he's so filled with like healing and hope that he, he comes every few years to share that story. I remember the time that he broke down the most while speaking about his life and his circumstances was he himself was a, was a survivor of sexual abuse. 
uh, also in his adolescence with an older Bachar in Yeshiva, and he speaks about it in vivid detail and what it was like for him. And he said, I did everything right. He's standing in front of my class, and he's like, I did everything right. I did everything I was supposed to do as a parent. I told my kids about these things. I told them about these experiences, and I shared with them that I'm, I'm here at any point. I'm willing to hear your story. You don't need to be afraid to share that story with me. And then he started breaking down. He said, a few years ago, my son, who was 17 at the time, shared with me his own history of abuse. And he said, and he's turning to this class, and he said, I don't, for the life of me, you're all going to become therapists. And you're going to tell people what it means uh, to, to do whatever they can to protect their kids. But I did all those things. And it still didn't work. And he said, I want you to know that I, I spent a great deal of time blaming myself. Like I did something wrong. I didn't open up that door wide enough. But then I realized that my son was just like me because I also had a loving parent. And I also had someone that I could turn to. Um, but the, the experience of, of sexual abuse is so dark. And even if you have that person there, you don't want to share it. And he said, that's, it's the story. The shame is so deep. That it's something that even if you have that person saying, please share it with me, um, it's a hard time to do that. I had recently a, a client of mine that I've been working with on and off for around eight years. Um, someone who suffered tremendously in his life. And it's been a really long journey. And it was always a sense that there's something missing in our work. Like some things didn't add up. Um, and literally it was a few weeks ago, after eight years, and I reviewed my notes. I asked him many times in many different types of ways. I reviewed it. I explored it. I asked him overtly. I alluded to it. It was after eight years that he finally shared with me an experience that was uh, that happened to him with his babysitter. Um, and and we're talking about someone who sat in my office for a very long time. And I try to create that space to say it's okay. Whoever you are, whatever you've been through, I could tolerate. And with all of that, it still took that long. And that's, it, if anything, it just paints a picture of how this really goes. And that shame turns into helplessness. There's a sense of, I can't, I can't do it for myself. Um, when there's something wrong with you, inherently wrong with you, not with what you've done, but with your essence, um, there's a sense of, I can't accomplish, I can't do much. Uh, there was a young boy, young man I worked with, um, who I remember I went above and beyond. Um, you know, there are certain things you do as a therapist, to let a person know that you care deeply about him. Um, I remember that while I was working with him, he had lost his job. He didn't have the ability to, to pay for therapy anymore. Uh, and for six months, I continued working with him. Um, it was only after he moved that we stopped. But still, there was a sense of there's something missing in this work. And I asked him one day. I finally built the cards and said, like, with all that we've, all the trust we've tried to create in this space, it still feels like there's something here that's missing. Um, there's a trust that's missing in our relationship. And he shared with me, he said, I'm just waiting. He said, Dr. Perlman, I'm waiting for you to hurt me. He said, I, I've never sat with an adult who hasn't hurt me. There's a person who was abused for, by several different people over the years. And that's all he knew. There was a sense of, yes, you could do nice things for me, but that's only because ultimately you're going to harm me. Um, and these individuals, there's some, when I think about this case, I, I, I look at myself. He used to walk outside at night. I was literally looking for people um, to harm him. But that's the only attention he knew. And I, I often think about this, this young boy at the time. He must have been 13 or 14 years old, taking walks by himself in, in a small kind of shtetl community. And, and I ask myself, where were we? Like, where were we? Where was I? Where were you? Yes, we don't live in those communities. But there was a child that was walking the streets looking for something, for someone to give them something positive as opposed to the negative. And it happened over and over again, still finding the wrong people. And that's a question we all need to sit and live with. Where were we that some of this stuff were permitted to happen um, under our watch because of our silence, because of that? And this... Ultimately, the story turns into a core belief. It turns into a core belief that there's something wrong with me. I'm bad. My essence is bad. I'm a helpless individual. No, no, no child ever deserves that, 
there's no nothing a person to do to live with that is their reality that they have to live with and all this pain it presents itself one way or another there's there's this this concept that's actually a Freudian idea called psychic determinism, um, which basically says that all pain will emerge, will manifest. Um, every therapist uses this analogy where, you know, when someone's having a panic attack or too much anxiety, where, you know, you've basically been in a boiling pot with the, with the cover on, and eventually you have a fire that's just, that's just raging underneath it, and eventually it blows over. And it's the same here. This pain will present itself. There's no way that it won't. Bray Brown, um, who's a wonderful author, a social worker who really explored the area of vulnerability. She has some beautiful books on it. Just want to read a quote that she wrote. She said, a deep sense of love and belonging is an irreducible need of all people. We are biologically, cognitively, physically, and spiritually wired to love, to be loved, and to belong. When those needs are not met, we don't function as we were meant to. We break, we fall apart, we numb, we ache, we hurt others, we get sick. I heard from a student of mine, it was a beautiful line uh, she said recently. She said, sick people, uh, hurt people, hurt others. Um, and it's a very similar type of concept where if you're hurt, you're in pain, you're going to ultimately look, it's going to manifest one way or another. Um, and, and we know this from studies as well. One of my favorite studies, the ACE study, it's called the Adverse Childhood Experience Study, basically looks at childhood experiences and, and could predict if you had several amounts of, of painful experiences raised with divorce, raised with fighting, raised with parents who are incarcerated, raised with dysfunction and, and being hit and, and abused and harmed, that the more events a child goes through um, in, their, in their earlier years, the more likely they are to have significant problems in their adult years. Um, for example, people who have four events, they're seven times more like four painful events in childhood, meaningful ones. They're seven times more likely to become alcoholics, 12 times more likely to commit suicide than anybody else. And that is just like a small piece of the research. It goes very, very deep. And, and when I did my own studies, when you look at the, the at-risk community, within the Jewish world, and you start reaching out to these people, and you ask them, what's the percentage of the participants of these kids, these boys and girls who are in these programs, what's the percentage of them have histories of, of sexual abuse or, or other forms of extreme abuse? I just, I asked a question about sexual abuse, forget about any other. In my own studies with all these programs, and I'd love to actually speak to, to my Dragos and see what they say about this, I, there was never a program that I spoke with that had less than 60% of their participants having history of sexual abuse. The average was 75% of all the participants. So when we look at, when we look at you know, the, the people who are suffering the most, uh, they need to find some degree of relief. They need to find some degree of, of comfort because of the pain that they ultimately live in. And there's, there's a wonderful uh, author, Gabor Mate, out in uh, Canada, and he said, um, it's, it's impossible to understand addictive behavior or harmful behavior without asking what relief it's provided for the person. And instead of looking at the behavior and saying, what's wrong with you? Why are you doing these things? Or even adolescence, which we're speaking about now, why are you sexually acting out? What's going on with you? We need to start asking questions like, what, what relief are they finding in that behavior? Not just desire, not just taiva, if we want to put that, but what relief are you actually discovering in that experience? I remember one of the, one of my first clients that was a real, real self-destructive character. He was someone who was using heroin. Um, and I, I knew very little about heroin at the time. Um, and, and I asked him, he did pretty challenging life. And I asked him just out of my own curiosity, but also trying to understand what was going on with him and why he made the choices he did. Like, what is it like? What's it like injecting a drug into your vein? What is, what is that whole experience like? And, and I was always, I was expecting him to say something like, you feel high, you feel wonderful, you feel numb, you feel relief. Um, some form of pleasure, that's my expectation. Some degree of pleasure. And, and to this day, his answer still haunts me, but it's really informed work I do, where his statement was, 
when I, and this is a quote, the first time I used heroin, I felt as though the world was holding me. I felt comfortable for the first time in my life. When you think about that, he wasn't talking about the pleasure and the joy that comes from some euphoric type of drug like heroin, which is very powerful. He was speaking about emotionally what it did to him. It was a person saying, I don't know how to receive hugs. I don't know how to feel loved because the, the essence of me is broken. So therefore, I use this thing because it gives me some sense of I'm being cared for, some sense of I'm being loved. Um, and, and that's the story. This is really the story of, of these individuals. Um, when they're engaging in this behavior, they're acting in ways that we see very, very outlandish, very harmful. We need to take a moment to reflect and pause and say, what are they really trying to communicate with? Instead of getting angry and frustrated, we need to be, be concerned and alarmed for sure. But instead of that happening, we need to ask them questions like, are you okay? Are you feeling quite all right? Why do you need to engage in, in these types of behaviors in order for you to feel like you could breathe? What is it ultimately about? And that needs to be our collective response ultimately um, as a community, as parents, as Rabbanim, um, and also as parents. Let's say for a minute about that role. Um, what is our role as parents? Um, and I know there's some questions. We're going to get them in just a few minutes. I just want to finish with a few ideas um and and then we'll we'll take it from there um <clears throat> i it used to be a lot easier for me to speak about parenting um because before i had teenagers of my own it was very simple it was sort of like a math equation you do this you do x y and z and things are going to be okay and then thankfully i've been been humbled by life and it sort of reminded me of, of how fragile we really are as people and reminded of the complexities that life ultimately offers us. And, and it's not simple. It's never simple being a parent. And we all know the challenges. If you're, there's too much control and we're too much on top of our kids, that, that often leads to dependency, someone who's withdrawn and fearful. Um, if we're too loose, we give them too much space. Uh, it, it leads to often to poor self-regulation, rebelliousness, aggressiveness. Um, and sort of leads us in this space of what's the right path to take. And a very non-exciting ideal becomes about staying in the battle with our children, staying in the battle with our relationship, because it's not going to go so well all the time. It's not going to be perfect. It's not going to be something where we have this, excuse me, X, Y, and Z formula, where everything is going to quite work out. But we need to create a lot of space a lot of space for exploration and discussion. Um, and, and often get the question of, of how, do you, how do we have these conversations with our kids? Now, which we need to have, because if our kids are not having this conversation with us, we need to know, and, and for certain we need to know, that they're going to be having conversation with someone. It's natural to explore themselves. It's natural, natural to be curious about their own bodies and what it feels like. Um, and, and, and to make sense of things and how do we actually speak to them about it. Um, and the truth is that if we, we don't start early, we don't start early on in the process, it becomes really, really hard for us to really catch up. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't start. It doesn't mean we should just sort of let it go because you need to know the conversation is being had. And if it's not with us, the best people they could have it with, it's going to be potentially with the worst people they could have it with. And that's Dr. Google, Rev Google, whatever you want to call it, or friends. And just so you know that when someone is, is trying to figure something out and it's a little bit taboo, the friend that they're going to ask for some clarification is generally speaking not going to be, you know, the most grounded, wisest kid in the class, the one we'd want our children to be asked a question from. Um, rather, it's going to be from places where the answers that they get are not necessarily going to be something uh, that we're all going to like. When we talk about sexual behavior in adolescence, um, there's no question that communities like ours with a very strong established set of values uh, tend to have less deviant sexual behavior in adolescence. There's a very strict set of guidelines and rules and ways to live your life. Um, so there's going to be less behavior because any type of behavior automatically puts them on the outside of the community and no one really wants that. Um, however, we need to know 
that everything that takes place outside of our community is also taking place within our community. All the behaviors that you'd look at and you'd see on TV, anywhere else, uh, personifying like a certain way of adolescents engaging in behavior with one another, it may not be as common or as frequent, but it is certainly happening within our community. But not only that, that if because of our clear set of values um, and, and our very sort of direct rules as to what's right and what's wrong, um, there's a great deal of shame and guilt related to any form of behavior within adolescence because there's a very clear set of expectations. So any deviation from that sort of derails an individual and often sets them off on this path that we've been speaking about, a secrecy of quiet, um, uh, of pain. And there are several different risk factors that we look at with different families, uh, but I think we all know that. Let's go back to the beginning of, of the presentation. The risk factors for people acting out sexually um, with, with, with others in certainly in a harmful type of way, uh, those risk factors are exponentially greater for people who've experienced pain in their lives, who've experienced harm. Uh, one way or another. These are people that are looking for some types of comfort and they're going to do whatever they can to potentially find. Um, so our role is a lot more about being, and I'm going to finish with this, there's a lot more to say, but we're, thankfully there are three other presentations on this subject matter, but there's a, a wonderful psychologist um, who really sort of came to fame in, in the 60s and 70s, uh, Carl Rogers, and he, when he speaks about therapy and he speaks about creating healing environments, he says it's a lot more about being than it is about doing. Most often we think about needing to do things dramatically, big programs, big ideas, but a lot of it is about being, that we ourselves need to expand. We ourselves need to be the ones who are, are honestly uh, taking a look at ourselves and saying, have we really opened the door for our children to communicate with us? Have we really invited them into that space? Uh, and that is about being. And, and if we notice that we haven't, then that's something that we absolutely need to do. We need to become individuals that no longer fears this reality. We can face it, we build our muscles, we build our strength, and we communicate effectively with our children about it. Uh, we need to understand that there are people around us that are struggling, uh, that don't necessarily have the language and the words, and they're looking to us to open that door so they could successfully walk through it. Um, and just to end, and I know we have a few questions, I just, I want to be conscientious of the time, uh, that Brene Brown says, that shame cannot survive empathy. It cannot survive being spoken. That all the shame, either from an experience of sexual abuse, um, it only exists in the world of shame if there is no empathy, there is no understanding, it remains in the world of secrecy. The wonderful thing about all of this is that there's a tremendous amount of healing. And I, I, I can't imagine a time when there was more healing, more awareness, uh, more programs that are openly helping people who are struggling in this type of way. And that in and of itself diminishes the shame. Um, so that's our objective. Our objective as parents uh, and educators speaking to our children about this is becoming people who are more accessible, more available, um, who open doors for people so they could discuss this, these issues, very sensitive issues with them, uh, and with the hopes that by doing so, uh, we'll prevent a great deal of pain. But not only that, we'll create a space, a platform for people who are already in pain to begin to heal on that journey. Uh, so I thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, and I know there's some questions um, Rabbi Avram, I believe, is going to come back on to ask some of these questions. Rabbi Muller, I'm sorry. Yeah, hi. Thank you very much, Dr. Perlman. That was wonderful. Uh, yes, we do have a number of questions. I don't know that we'll be able to get to all of them, but let's try. Um, first of all, do you have any resource to recommend to parents to have a talk or a series of talks? As you said, many of us don't have the vocabulary. Um, yeah. Uh, There's a, a um, structure or guideline for such yeah. kinds. Actually, I have it right here. This is one of the books I recommend to parents. Um, this is by Sharon Maxwell called The Talk. Um, there's another book that's very similar to this for the From community. Um, I forget the name of the author, but this happens to be a great book. Uh, what your kids need to hear from you about their own emerging sexuality, 
It's called The Talk, uh, The Breakthrough Guide to Raising Healthy Kids in an Over-Sexualized Online Interface World. Uh, it's very direct. It's very clear. There are, there are two new pamphlets that, are, that have just come out in the firm community, one by Dr. Shlomi Zimmerman, um, which I think has been endorsed by the OU. It should be coming out shortly. And there's another one um, that just came out. I actually just saw it in, in Mishpacha or Ami. Uh, they had an advertisement for it. Um, I forget the name of it, but I will send it out to Madrigos. I'll send them a list of resources that, that they could forward to the parents who are here. Great, thank you. Um, well, what should a parent do? And should a parent be concerned when they have a teenager, sounds like it's a teenage girl, who locks herself in a room for several hours a day and uh, doesn't communicate and doesn't want to change that behavior. Is that a sign that something's going on? Is it regular turmoil and angst? Well, well, it definitely is a sign that that communication has shut down. You know, it's a sign of that. Um, and it, obviously it's typical for teenagers to be moody uh, and to need their own space. But what you're describing, it seems to be a person who's uh, somewhat withdrawn, disconnected from the relationship with their parents. Now, again, I don't think children, it's certainly adolescents, need to be best friends with their parents. But when communication is down um, in a way where there really, there really isn't uh, a sense of openness, and when a kid comes home, they're straight in their room for hours at a time, it's just a sign. It's a sign that there's something wrong. We didn't go through this, uh, but there's a lot to speak about when, like, what are the warning signs for some, some of the, the indicators that something is not quite right? And, and there's a whole description. You could find, easily find them online. Um, but with all those descriptions, at the very core, you need to know your child's baseline. You need to know who they generally are and how they generally act. Uh, and if you don't know that, then none of these signs really matter. So you have a child who's really not engaging with their parents, then that's something that uh, we need to do whatever we can to rebuild that relationship. And, and in any context, it doesn't have to be in a serious way, just in a fun way, an engaging way, in a, in a pleasant way. I'd start with that first. What, what suggestions would you have for a parent, and that might even be people who are currently on this uh, uh, seminar, uh, if they themselves are victims of abuse? And as you mentioned uh, an instance before, of a parent who tried to protect the child and felt that they had failed. What what is, what is what should a person do about self care in terms? You know, they're an adult now. They're the parent now. They're the caregiver, and now they have to take care of somebody who's going through the same trauma. Yeah, I I, I so appreciate that question because um, it it sounds to me like it's a person who's saying, I I know I need to take care of myself, and I know I may not be doing it as well as I I have been and should be. Um, and the, the the beauty the beauty of today is that there are so many networks of people who are supporting one another. Uh, there are so many places where you could get that just mutual support without needing to go to therapy, a place to talk, a place to share, a place to communicate your pain with others. Um, I know that it's nearly impossible. I'm, aside from speaking as a parent now, I'm also speaking as a therapist, that it's nearly impossible to care for others when you're in a place where you're not really cared for yourself. Um, and we need to start with that. It's like when you're on an airplane and it's going down, the oxygen, you know, drops. They always tell you first take care of yourself and then take care of your child. Otherwise, every, the whole plane's going down. Nothing's going to work. Um, and we need to pay attention to that and go to the spa, find a friend to really be honest with, um, enjoy a coffee, light a fire today. It's wonderful. We have like two feet of snow here in New York. Um, do whatever you can to nurture your soul and and to make sure that you're attending to the pain that you've been through. You know, society today, we find that the system objectifies people, specifically the question is asking about the shuttle system. And I don't know if I think that's a rabbit hole that we won't get out of so easily. <laughs> I'm not gonna wanna go down there. But, the, you know, we are Baruch Hashem, a, a very well-developed community and a large community and often people feel that they're being dealt with as a commodity and, and, and so on. Does that tie into this discussion? Um, is there a trauma that's related with that? I, there's, there's no question that being objectified in any respect is traumatizing in its own right. And, and there is also no question that 
we have our flaws as, as a people. Um, where there is, we somehow feed into that process of objectifying others or evaluating people in areas that we shouldn't necessarily do. I happen to think this question is a very pertinent question to like eating disorders, because that's where that type of objectification tends to, to, to land, um, where there's, it sort of turns on you on the inside. Uh, but yeah, there's, when, when that's the case, if we're not educating boys and girls, on, on what it means to see another, to see a person for who they are on the inside. Um, and we're only sort of educating them to evaluate others by their successes or their physical appearance, then we're missing something, we really are. Um, and, and that's across the board, uh, but there's a deep pain in, in being objectified in any respect. Any ideas about when 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 is when is speaking to their child and the child is very uncomfortable, especially if we initiate it because we're trying to be a responsible parent. You know, out of the blue, we just have the talk. Yes, it doesn't know what hit them. Um, well, again, for those parents who still have young kids, it's not. If we start early with some basic language, um, which again, I'm sure other presenters will, will touch upon. Um, if we start early with that basic language, it's much less, you know, awkward once you get to the adolescent stage and the conversation gets a little bit more intense. However, don't expect it to be not awkward. Expect it to be uncomfortable. That doesn't mean you shy away from it. It just means you're walking into an uncomfortable situation. Um, and that's okay. And have that conversation once. And even if it's uncomfortable, follow up with another one in a month's time wait a little bit and go back to it. Over time, it'll become a little bit better. But one conversation to me is, is certainly not enough because uh, one conversation, most of the time it ends up becoming very awkward and uncomfortable for everybody. And everyone just wants to leave either that car or wherever you are. Um, and that's okay, that's a normal reaction. But if you have it again, a second or a third time, uh, eventually the child will begin to believe you when you say, I'm really here for you, and I'm willing to have uncomfortable conversations with you. You send, a very, you send the opposite message of, listen, son or daughter, I could have uncomfortable conversations with you. It gets really uncomfortable, and then you never have it again. So you're kind of erasing your own message that you're trying to impart. Thank you so much. That was really informative and uh, important and pertinent to us as parents. Uh, thank you, Dr. Perlman. Thank you, everybody who attended tonight. And I would like thank to you. remind everybody that this coming Monday evening, February 8th, same time, uh, we're going to be having a presentation by Mrs. Rachel Zimmerman on the topic of keeping our kids safe through middle school, homeschool, school, and camp. And there too, we will get uh, some practical pointers. I know one of the questions we didn't uh, raise tonight was some practical ways of keeping our kids safe, aside from, of course, uh, discussing things with them and making sure that we have a close connection around this topic with them. Thank you so much again and keep safe everybody and keep warm. Thank Have a good night. Bye-bye.